introduction. Okay, let me. Um, so today I'm going to talk uh, mostly about a project that I run at Sandia National Labs and a little bit about the work uh, that it took to build it up to where it is today. Uh, so actually, first I'm going to talk a little bit about like about Sandia National Labs in general, as well as the quantum activities we have going on there. And then I'll switch to this project QScout, which stands for the Quantum Scientific Computing Open User Testbed. And I'll go into a little more detail about what that means, along with what its goals are, the architecture, and then some example research that's been done already on the system. Okay, so Sandia National Labs is uh, based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, over here. Um, before I worked here, New Mexico wasn't really on on the map as a as a place to go, and and actually now I really love it here. Uh, the Sandia is a U.S. Department of Energy National Lab. Uh, where uh, staff scientists come together to work on a variety of projects, uh, mostly uh, in the national interest. Uh, mostly, it is a uh, it makes uh, safety devices for our nuclear weapons is its primary focus. But uh, there's a lot of other research that comes in under the umbrella of national security, including a lot of quantum research. And um, if you haven't been to Albuquerque, uh, New Mexico, or haven't even thought about it, we have a really cool balloon fiesta in the October uh, every year where you get you can get up close to a whole bunch of balloons lifting off and it's it's really an amazing experience and there's also uh, the mountains are pretty nearby uh, for hiking and stuff. Uh, so quantum at Sandia, we have a lot of uh, Qubit technologies that are here uh, that, you know, maybe uh, people might not be aware of. I focus on trapped ions uh, right now, and uh, so I'm going to be talking more about the trapped ion uh, part of things. But we also, within trapped ions, we have a lot of like, control hardware development, as well as we have groups that are working on trapped ion clocks. Um, GPS denied navigation is a is a big uh, hot topic in national security research. So uh, a good clock is a uh, small and good clock is uh, uh, easy to get funding for. Uh, we have atom projects uh, where that are focused on quantum computing as well as uh, quantum sensing. Uh, there's a effort here for gate defined quantum dots, which I worked with them for six months as well. Uh, so I learned how to put together a dill fridge and to tune up a quantum dot, which is a really interesting experience. Um, uh, they, they focus on quantum computing. We have uh, two, we have actually more than two, but I've only listed two here, pretty significant theory efforts. Uh, we have the QPL, which stands for the Quantum Performance Laboratory. Uh, they, uh, they are really interested in benchmarking quantum computing systems. So helping people figure out what types of errors are in their system and comparing systems to each other in a fair way. And then we also have a group that's developed to quantum algorithms and algorithm development. We have an NV Center uh, in Diamond project, uh, our NV Center in Diamond research. Uh, they are particularly interested in quantum sensing and uh, they, uh, actually, in a recent project with them, uh, they helped us. This is a picture. This little bow tie structure here is a picture of one of our uh, ion traps. We were getting some shorts in our after fabrication, and they were able to use the NV uh, sensor to uh, inject current into the shorted electrodes, and we could find out where the current was going. So, and uh, and then we could look into our fabrication process and figure out what was causing that short in our ion trap. And so, so that's a nice uh, example of a, a uh, quantum system helping us build a better quantum system. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, we also have a superconducting group, um, but they never email me back. So I don't actually know what they do, but uh, we, there is superconducting uh, quantum, quantum research also going on at Sandia. Um, so trapped ions at Sandia, let's focus in on the trapped ions for a bit. There's even a lot of different type of research in trapped ions. Uh, in particular, Sandia is well known for making uh, trapped ion surface traps, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but we, we design and make these traps and we distribute them to groups, trapped ion groups around the world. And the, the new direction that this is going now is to put in a lot of integrated photonics into the ion trap. So right now, 
uh, the state of the art is you have uh, a chip that has a bunch of electrodes on it that helps you trap your ion. And then you control your ion by sending in laser beams from free space um, you know, to hit the ion. What we're working on, which has a big effort now, is uh, building structures into the ion trap chip that would allow us to uh, send uh, the lasers in maybe edge couple on the side and then route them throughout where they need to go in the chip and then hit the ion. Um, and that that stuff like that will really help with scalable systems. Uh, Q Scout again is the project I'm going to be talking about, which is sort of a um, I I hate to use the word full stack, but um, it it is sort of a full stack system where you know you can sort of participate at at almost any level at the ground floor of the system or uh, up at a very high level of just sort of writing circuits and seeing what comes out. Uh, there's a lot of control systems research, uh, getting getting classical control systems to a quantum system is uh, is sort of turning into a, a big area of research and and sort of and very important for making your quantum system work well. Uh, ion transport, uh, moving ions around on these chips. Uh, again, microfabricated trap characterization, uh, a lot of uh, theory, and then a lot of clockwork is going on in terms of the trapped ion research at Sandia. Okay, so now moving on to the project Q Scout. Um, so it is, as I said before, the quantum scientific computing open user test bed. It's funded by the US Department of Energy. You might be familiar with the model uh, where uh, the Department of Energy hosts uh, supercomputers for people to do research. So people can uh, submit jobs to run on uh, one of a DOE hosted supercomputer and, and then they get the results back. Or maybe in a similar model is sort of the astronomy model where they have uh, you know, very fancy telescopes that were built sort of for public use. And you know, people can write proposals to submit you know, to look at various parts of the sky, and then they can get the results back for their research. Uh, QScout's the same idea, except with a quantum computer. Uh, so we're building a quantum computer that um, people can write proposals for to, uh, to, to run on our system and get results back to do research. Um, as you may know, uh, there's actually, and I still cannot believe I'm saying this, there are actually several commercial quantum computing systems available now. Uh, in particular, IBM Q was kind of the leader in all of this, uh, getting these publicly accessible quantum computing hardware. Uh, there's Rigetti, IonQ, Quantinium, uh, 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 quite a, there's there's a lot. Uh, these systems had uh, have to um, get a lot of throughput and have a lot of and have very high performance. Uh, but to do so, they had to make certain choices that make them a little bit less flexible. And so Q Scout fills the gap in between, um, you know, a a system that's publicly available, but gives uh, we get to we use, have fewer users, so we get to work more in depth with our users and give them a little bit more flexibility and access to more of the guts of the system to under to really understand how the machine works instead of just how well my algorithm works on this machine. Um, and uh, we also were funded under the the uh, the goal of helping the Department of Energy evaluate near-term quantum computing. So that's the sort of the NISC architecture is what I, the noisy intermediate quantum systems architecture. So in building the quantum uh, computer, it's really turned into, uh, it's not about the physicists anymore. It's really about, uh, there's a lot of different expertise that needs to come together to build a, a complete quantum system. Uh, so, but you still need physicists, experimental, theoretical physicists. Uh, since we build our own chips in-house, we need fabrication specialists, uh, RF electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, optical engineers, software engineers. And I apologize for these numbers. Um, this, this is not the number of people, but rather the department that they are in in Sandia, so it doesn't really have a lot of meaning if you're not a Sandian, but they come from a bunch of different departments. And uh, and so that's why national labs are really a great choice for this kind of work, because we have all this expertise uh, that we can pull upon to, to really help us build the best system that we can. 
So uh, I mentioned that the goal was to give have a little bit more flexibility. We have this sort of uh, statement here that's kind of a mouthful, uh, but to provide users with a versatile toolbox for interfacing with fundamental features of a trapped ion system to advance quantum computing research. So uh, we and and we also want to think about what kinds of questions would people want to answer that they can't with a uh, a commercially available machine or uh, what kind of questions they might want to answer and they uh, couldn't don't really have the the funding or the uh, ability to build the machine themselves so the questions that we want to answer or what we want to understand is a better understanding of how quantum machines work and how they fail in particular uh, in, we are particularly suited for studying new techniques for coding, encoding, and compiling quantum circuits. And ultimately, we want to build a roadmap for building a larger and more sophisticated machine. Uh, to achieve those goals, uh, this project offers a lot of unique features. Um, in particular, uh, we offer pulse level control of the phase amplitude and frequency of all of our gates. Our gates are performed with uh, laser pulses and they need to be uh, and they need to have a particular frequency phase and amplitude to uh, uh, create the interaction that we want in our qubit. Uh, but um, so we offer some standard gates that people uh, that are just sort of interested at the circuit level can use, but if people are interested in maybe building a new type of gate that uh, has extra robustness to certain types of noise, this is a feature that they might want to use. Uh, we also offer a fully parameterized gate set, which makes us a little bit special. Um, by that, I mean uh, we offer an entangling gate where you can um, not only specify the phase at the end of your entangling gate, which is common, most people offer that, but we also allow you to specify the amount of entanglement that you want. So most, most groups offer a fully entangling two qubit gate. Uh, we offer a, um, you can specify the amount of entanglement you want uh, up to and fully, fully entangled gate. And that is useful for making your circuit shorter in a lot of cases. So a lot of times uh, in circuits, uh, you're, you're actually creating more entanglement than you need when you have when you're limited to these fully entanglement gates. And then you have to use a combination of single qubit gates and uh, another uh, fully entangling gate to actually take out the, the extra entanglement that you added in. So uh, there's some tricks you can play with circuit optimization if you once you have access to that to that tool. Uh, we also offer precise scheduling of gates within a circuit. Um, uh, it, it's getting better now, but some of the commercial systems, if you submit a circuit, uh, there might be some optimization behind the scenes where you actually don't know when your gates were run relative to each other. Um, again, uh, they're adding more tools for transparency now, but it's um, that's something that's uh, very easily accessible on the QScap machine. And I think the real added value of the Q Scout system is the interaction with the Sandia scientists. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at the data and thinking about the data, and uh, and we have some insights into how trapped ion systems work. And so, uh, when you submit a project, you know it, it isn't just you submit a project and you get the answer back. You submit a project, we'll send you back the data, we'll send you back any calibration data you want, and we'll uh, and and we'll work. You know, and if if something is not quite what you expected, you know, we'll work with you to try and figure out why that might have happened, or if there's some noise source that we weren't considering before, or something like that. And uh, another way I like to describe it is I think of uh, most of the commercial offerings as sort of a, a duplex Lego set where, uh, you know, you can build a lot of really cool stuff with duplex Legos, but we offer a much more varied uh, Lego set. And then even if you don't like the Legos we have, you can send us instructions for 3D printing a uh, new Lego and we can we can do that for you too. So uh, that's that's just a Lego analogy. We're not actually 3D printing Legos. Um, OK, so for architecture and engineering, um, I, for your trapped ion system, what do you need? Uh, you need vacuum. You need some electric fields to trap your ion to hold it where you want it. You need some lasers to control your ion. And you need some detectors to know what's, you know, at the end of the day when you do your measurement, what state your ion was in. 
I don't know, that's it. It's, not, it's no big deal, right? Um, in uh, just one caveat with the electric fields, uh, you can't trap an ion with just DC electric fields. Um, because how electric fields work, there's Earnshaw's theorem, where if you have electric field lines that are coming in, they also have to squirt out somewhere. So while you're trying to create a trap with just DC fields, you're also creating an anti-trap with DC fields. That's where the lines squirt out, if that if that makes sense. And that's the technical term of uh, electric field lines. So uh, we have to use a combination of RF fields, which um, create a trap and anti-trap, but spin it fast enough that the ion doesn't see the anti-trap is, is one way to think of it. So, it. so the ion is sitting in this potential that's spinning all the time, and it doesn't notice that uh, sometimes it, it might you know, prefer to be kicked out of the trap. So, and then we also have, uh, so the ions trapped in the spinning potential, and then we also have some DC fields that hold it uh, in place in the third dimension. All right, that was probably more detail that I wanted to talk about for the DC fields. Uh, so when, uh, five years ago, when we uh, got the grant for this project, uh, we had a lot of experience with trapped ions. But we had uh, to build, to run a useful circuit. We still had a lot of capability that we had to bring to Sandia. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we built some of these things up for anyone that's interested in, in trapped ions and how uh, trapped ion systems work. Um, so one, uh, we were used to dealing with one and two ions, but there are some special techniques that go into dealing with multiple ions. So we needed to get those uh, going, uh, not only shaping the electric fields that the ions sit in, but also determining what sort of architecture we're going to use. Uh, we had to individually address ions or pairs of ions. Uh, previously, we had only used fairly large laser beams that would hit uh, one or two ions at once, uh, but they, you know, they wouldn't be able to address just a single ion. Um, we also, at the time, five years ago, there wasn't a lot of, there weren't as many options for uh, quantum uh, languages for talking with your machine as there are now. So uh, we actually had to write our own quantum assembly language to exactly match the features that we were offering. Um, we also needed new hardware for the pulse uh, generation. Um, our hardware was a little bit limited in terms of the features that we wanted to offer this full phase frequency and amplitude control. So uh, there was that was a pretty big part of this project. And then also we needed distinguishable detection of each ion. Uh, at the time, we only had sort of a global detector that could look at all the ions and it could tell you how many were bright, but it wouldn't tell you which ion was bright, which is important information when you're running your circuits. Um, so for trapped ion architectures, there's sort of two main architectures. Uh, you can either uh, have your ions in zones. Uh, so you'd have a zone here where you can address it with lasers, and then you move your ions around to different zones to interact with different ions. And Quantinium, uh, formerly Honeywell, uses this architecture, and it's uh, they're doing a really great job with it. And it, I, I think ultimately the, the trapped ions moving forward is going to be some combination of these two architectures, but uh, right now uh, they're small enough that you could sort of pick one or the other. Uh, but for us, uh, we would have to do a lot more development work we'd have uh, that we thought was going to take us too long to do. So we instead chose the long single chain method where all your ions are in the same trapped well, which means they can interact with each other. Uh, they all feel the Coulomb force of the other ion, and then they can set up these vibrations. And then you can use those vibrational modes as a bus to have the ions talk to each other and do your two qubit gate. And um, for that, we were going to need to be a way to individually address our ions. So we needed to get our laser beams small enough and with uh, a low enough crosstalk that they didn't interfere with the ion that's neighboring. And uh, there's also, we needed some ways to manage frequency crowding, which I'm actually not going to go into too much in this talk. Um, and also, this had been demonstrated at the University of Maryland, where I um, sort of kind of come from, and uh, we were pretty confident that we could uh, build up a similar system with uh, uh, pretty quickly, which was part of the what we needed to do. So the heart of our system, as I mentioned, is a trapped ion chip. Uh, we fabricate these at Sandia. 
Uh, here's some SEM images of them. Uh, you can see on the top, uh, there's uh, these little squares here are electrodes, uh, and then some of this long, uh, this is going to be very hard to see, some of this long electrode here is the RF electrode. And so we can get really precise control of our ion positions by using all of these electrodes. Um, uh, we had sort of three traps that are specific to QScout. Right now, the current system is using the Peregrine trap, which is just a linear trap. But we also have the Roadrunner trap that's coming out, uh, that's out and uh, will be implemented pretty soon that'll allow us to reorder our ions by moving some subset of them into this extra arm here, another subset into this arm, and then it'll allow us to do a mid-circuit measurement or a, or, or a qubit reset, as uh, you asked about earlier today. Um, uh, these electrodes give us pr really good control of our... Uh, let me go back to my uh, arrow option. Oh, maybe I can't do it. OK, uh, let me try again. Rid of that. OK, and so they give us really good control over the position of our ions. This is looking down. And we were able to create this video of the ions spinning around each other by changing the voltages that we apply on apply to these electrodes. Um, we've gotten a lot of mileage out of that video, so uh, take take videos for your PI if you're <laughs> if you're a student, they'll use them a lot. Uh, okay. Let me see. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so we actually have two Q Scout systems right now. We have the room temperature system, which is for our round one and round two users. Uh, it has a vacuum chamber and the chip is inside and you can see there's a lot of uh, optics on the outside here to bring our laser beams in. Uh, we're also working on the cryogenic system, which is nominally going to be for the third round users, in, including uh, Marina's project, but um, it's possible that it won't actually be ready by next month in which case uh, it might also be run on the room temperature system. Uh, this one's kind of neat because we designed a special package for it that, that we take this lid and place it on top of the package using this ring as a to form a seal. And then that goes into a, a smaller, um, it doesn't look that small. It's, we call it the Keurig. It kind of looks like a Keurig here with this part. Um, and uh, and then it, it goes inside and we can send laser beams in through these windows and there's windows on the outside of the cryostat. Um, let's see, individual addressing of ions. Uh, we had a, uh, okay, we had a, um, a 32 channel AOM. So we took one laser beam and it, this this device uh, splits that laser beam into 32 laser beams. Each of those laser beams goes through a its own AOM crystal. Uh, we can then send an RF signal to that crystal uh, that has a particular frequency, amplitude, and phase that then gets written on to that individual laser beam. Then uh, that each individual laser beam is then, there's a very non-trivial optical imaging step, uh, is then imaged onto an individual ion. So then we can just control the RF that we're applying to that AOM crystal, and that will control the laser beam that is going to hit that ion. So that's how we do our individual uh, optical addressing. Um, this is sort of a detail of the uh, due to the ion that we're using, uh, we use uh, 171 ytterbium ions, so which uh, in the, the periodic table, they're down in the rare earth, that little section on the periodic table that's separate from the rest of the periodic table. Um, but they actually form a really good ion. They, uh, they have a pretty simple nuclear system. And while they use UV beams uh, down to 355 nanometers, they don't use deep UV beams like 285 or 213, which some of the other ions use, which make them a little friendlier and easier to deal with. Um, so I talked about the uh, the 32 channel AOM. So that provides our individual beams. We also have a global beam uh, of 355 nanometers on the other side that uh, allows us to address uh, the motion. So I told you that the gates talk to, the ions talk to each other via their motional modes. If you just hit the ion with a laser beam from one side, you actually can't uh, excite a motional mode. But when you have laser beams coming from both sides, uh, you can get the momentum kick that you need 
to uh, actually uh, make the ions start ringing at exactly the frequency that you want. Um, so the two cubic gates, we use two tones. Uh, we're, we're also using, uh, we're, I'm getting into a lot of details here about how uh, ion traps, how our particular system works, which may, may not be quite as interesting. So I'll maybe hold off on some of those and, and we can ask more at the end. Uh, uh, getting those these individual beams onto our ions though was actually, we were really worried about how we were going to do that. Uh, we had an optical engineer help us uh, design uh, the the optical setup, which was like which was seven or eight uh, seven or eight optical elements, but they were all had very tight tolerances in their uh, position reference to each other and then to the ion. So uh, we engaged a mechanical engineering team, which took those seven and eight optical elements and took them into three uh, structures and um, bonded them and aligned them to each other using an auto collimator and then bonded them in place. So then they reduce that seven or eight optical element to a three optical element uh, um, uh, structure, which was actually quite straightforward to align. So um, that uh, I, I'm not sure how we would have done it without them. So that was, um, I think that was well worth it to engage a mechanical engineering team. Um, I think, uh, Okay, I'll give a little bit about the Molmer Sorensen gate, about how uh, uh, two cubic gates work with uh, trapped ions. So I mentioned the motional modes. Uh, what it what it is is it's equivalent to a spin dependent force in a rotated basis. So you have your measurement basis, and then you switch to your rotated basis, and uh, and when you apply your laser beams, you're actually pushing the the particular states of that rotated basis relative to each other. Uh, each while you have the laser beams on, each of those uh, rotated basis vectors acquire a phase, a geometric phase. And then at the end of the interaction, uh, certain terms will then cancel and you can be left with a maximally entangled state, assuming you've left your light on long enough. A lot of times people uh, show that via these phase space diagrams um, where uh, you originally maybe start at the origin and then your interaction has certain states in this case, the zero one and the one zero state, they, they accumulate that geometric phase while these two states did not. And then uh, and then when you rotate back to the basis that you started in, uh, you uh, end up with a, uh, a maximally entangled state of, of just two of these four states in the other basis. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of a complicated gate. It took me a few months to actually under, understand it. So you're probably not gonna to get it from this five minute uh, talk, but uh, or this five minute little intro, but uh, that's that's kind of the basic idea. You're applying your laser beams, you're, you're making your ions uh, move relative to each other in a particular way. So they develop this geometric phase that if you have everything just right, it cancels. Um, our current default gates, um, I think I'm actually gonna skip this slide. Uh, so our distinguishable detection, um, yes, fear not, I do have a uh, picture, a level, an energy level diagram of uh, Ytterbium-171. Uh, it has an S manifold at the bottom where we use the two uh, so-called clock states as our qubit states. So the lower one is zero and the top one is one. They're separated by 12.6 gigahertz. Um, if we turn on light between uh, the S state transition and this lower P state transition, uh, it is what's known as a cycling transition. So it will it will fall into one of these upper S states continuously. And so we can just turn light on and we can keep getting light out. We can get lots of photons out. So that would be how we would detect if we're in the zero and one state. Because if we turn this light on and we're in the zero state, we'll just stay in the zero state. Um, our distinguishable detection is uh, pretty good. Our SPAM, which is the state preparation uh, and measurement, uh, average infidelity is around 2.3 uh, times 10 to the minus three. So, and then this with a four, e to the minus four uh, um, in, uh, variation on that. Uh, and so our detect step is really, we just turn that light on 
we wait a certain amount of time. If we get above a certain number of photons, I think in this case, uh, if we get more than one photon, we label it uh, bright or one. And if we get below that number of photons, we label it zero. And so that would be dark or zero. And so that we can do, uh, we do that uh, pretty well. For our distinguishable detection, uh, we actually have a instead of having a global PMT that's looking at all of the all of the ions and PMT is photomultiplier tube, which is just a, a very sensitive detector, we image each ion onto a, a separate core of a multi-core fiber. So um, here's a here's a picture of it. You can kind of see there's a line here which you can't really see the individual cores, but uh, that line is sort of where the cores are. And then each of those cores is broken out into a different fiber, which then goes to its own PMT. So each ion not only has its own laser beam from the individual addressing optics, it also has its own detector uh, that, uh, that tells if it's in the bright state or the dark state. And then uh, our crosstalk is uh, one of our smallest errors in our system, which is five times 10 to the minus four. Um, and then, as I mentioned five years ago, when we were working on this, uh, the, the talking to the quantum machine was a little bit limited to a couple languages. And they, and they at the time, they didn't have the features that we, that we needed. Um, uh, and in particular, a lot of them were geared towards superconducting qubit systems. And this um, was a, uh, and this was a trapped ion system. So we had some things that we could do like uh, parallel operations that we wanted to be able to offer that wasn't uh, available in the languages at the time. So uh, we it made this uh, programming language called Jackal, which is just another quantum assembly language, which if you are a computer scientist, this is very funny. And if you are not a computer scientist, it's only kind of funny, but uh, apparently there's another joke on top of the joke. Um, uh, but this has also morphed into uh, a bunch of different flavors of, of Jackal, and we've just we just finished today a two day webinar for our third round users about how to uh, use these different levels of Jackal to interact with the machine. So this is all kind of fresh in my mind. Um, but uh, so we have uh, Jackal itself is a pretty simple language. It just you list out what gates you can say if you want them to be done at the same time or after each other and which qubits they should be applied to and so on. Um, we also offer Jackal Pack, which allows people to do a little more complicated things. So there's metaprogramming with Python, so you can manipulate these circuit, these you know simple circuits. And it also we give you an emulator for small numbers of qubits to see to make sure you actually wrote you know, what you intended to write. Um, and uh, and then we also give people that uh, low level control where they could specify how they want their pulse to look instead of just using our default pulses. I also mentioned we had to make this custom firmware. Um, uh, we call it Octet. It's somewhere between a DDS and a, uh, a direct digital synthesizer and an AWG or an arbitrary waveform generator. So uh, the person that made it uh, likes to call it an arbitrary waveform modulator which uh, when our users uh, specify their their gates, they write, uh, they, they can send us a list of, of so-called spline knots, and then those uh, can be interpolated together uh, to actually write out the phase frequency and amplitude that they want. Okay, so where are we now in our system? What can our system do? Uh, we are at five, five ions, and they are fully connected, except uh, a couple of the, the connections are not well calibrated. So if you try and do a two qubit gate between certain pairs right now, uh, it won't be a very good two qubit gate, but uh, we're working on getting uh, that calibration step uh, done in a way that's scalable. So when we add more qubits, it'll, uh, that'll be a little bit easier for us. Um, uh, I, I think some of the coherence times are maybe less interesting. Ions have very long coherence times compared to uh, other systems. Uh, our gate times, our single qubits is kind of on the tens of microseconds and our two qubit gates on is about 200 microseconds. Uh, the biggest error in our system is the two qubit gate error to probably the surprise of no one. Uh, depending on the ion pair, uh, we either have a 98 or 99% uh, percent fidelity gate. Uh, which actually is really good. I'm, I'm really happy with that. Um, and uh, that's that's kind of, that's that's our major error right now. 
Uh, okay, so now I'm going to go over a couple external research projects or uh, people that have used QScout and talk a little bit about what kind of research they're doing. Um, so QScout users are chosen via competitive proposal process. Potential users submit proposals. Uh, it goes to a group external to QScout, uh, but there's still a mix of Sandians and people outside of Sandia to evaluate the proposals uh, based on technical merit, uh, how well they fit with what we can do in the machine, and then also how well uh, how well they might show off some of some of QScout's features. Um, successful proposals are run on the machine with lots of iterations back and forth with the Sandia scientists, and then, you know, uh, nominally we advance the field of quantum information. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. Okay, so the QScout collaborators so far, uh, we, uh, there is uh, Marina is uh, our, one of our round three users uh, from UC Davis, uh, and hopefully maybe there will be more from UC Davis moving forward. Uh, we have a lot of people on the East Coast. We have a couple from Europe and uh, sort of a mix of national labs, uh, companies, and academic institutions. So uh, one of the... Uh, one of the groups, uh, Indiana University, was one of our first round users, and they uh, had a pretty neat idea uh, that they use on our, our system. So they're interested in uh, studying or simulating this uh, D-man uh, uh, molecule, which I cannot pronounce uh, what it is actually called, uh, and nor did I write it on the slide, so I, I, I don't even know, but it it, it's a molecule, it looks like this, it has this sort of a proton that hops back and forth between these two sites while the electron goes around the bottom through the molecule. So it has some kind of interesting time dynamics in how that proton hops back and forth. And um, it, it exhibits sort of, it's sort of a useful kind of toy system to look at that has some properties that are similar to other systems. Uh, they had developed a, a really neat mapping of this nuclear lattice Hamiltonian onto an Ising Hamiltonian, which is what uh, trapped ions sort of exhibit naturally. And in doing so, uh, they made uh, their, their project consisted of a circuit that was just uh, actually, um, it was just a, the same number of uh, it, it just basically five five gates, or I think it was 15 gates. I, maybe not everything is represented here. And three two qubit gates. Uh, and each time step was the exact same circuit, but with slightly different angles on all of the gates. So, and that that in some sense that makes that experiment really great for our system because to simulate a a really far out time. They don't have to like wait a long time or add a whole bunch of a whole bunch more gates, which would probably make our system lose fidelity. They're just changing the angles that they're applying. So we have sort of the same fidelity basically at whatever time uh, time step that they want to look at. And so, uh, uh, it, so uh, they would get back data that would look uh, something like this, which is hard to interpret they would uh, run it back through their system and map it back onto their, their nuclear lattice Hamiltonian. And then they were able to map the dynamics of some different initial states. So if we look at this uh, picture on the left here, uh, if you start in lattice site A, which is the one furthest on the left, um, here uh, going down on this picture is the time evolution. You can see that the system uh, oscillates between the two extreme lattice sites here. So it uh, starts in A, jumps to this other side, and back and forth, and back and forth. If you start in B instead, so this is all data. The blue is the data. Uh, you can see there's some more interesting uh, time dynamics. Looks like there's some more frequencies in there. And then C also more as uh, interesting time dynamics. And then D is actually an eigenstate of the system. And our system also showed that because there's no real change in the system with each time step. They were then able to take those uh, uh, that mapping into a spectra and an energy level diagram. And again, it, they were just using two ions. And this is a system that's well studied. Uh, and you know, and they so they were able. So we know what the right answer is. But our uh, the results from our system 
uh, pretty much nailed the right answers. You can see this gray line, and then you can see that our data falls right on the gray line within the error bars. Um, and so the idea is this type of problem really fits well with uh, quantum quantum computing moving forward. So once we have a bigger system that's you know harder to simulate, the hope is that they could apply this same technique to um, uh, to simulate something that maybe we couldn't uh, that we don't know about classically. Uh, and so why was QScout a good fit for this? Uh, one, it's free to use. Um, uh, the uh, Indiana maybe is not, uh, you know, it's not like um, a, a super rich college. Uh, and so they were able to try lots of different things to figure out what was actually going to work. Uh, the Jackal language, the way that we had it uh, running. Uh, it made running these, this exact same sequence, but with different angles, somewhat a trivial thing for them to run. So that uh, made it really efficient on our system. The nature of their algorithm was insensitive to the types of errors that we were seeing on QScout. Um, if I go back to what their data looked like, uh, the dotted lines here is the emulator. Uh, so that's exactly what we expect. And the the points are the 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 data results. And so you see, even though, uh, say, on this first point here, we'd expect the data to be all the way at one, where maybe it's somewhere in the 90 ish percent of that, they're actually, when they um, analyze this data, they were only really looking at the Fourier transform. So the fact that uh, the exact values didn't go all the way to one didn't matter so much as long as we were capturing that frequency dynamic um, that they were looking for. And, and we were. So, um, so that was great. And then it mapped naturally to an Ising Hamiltonian. Um, another one, uh, another type of project is sort of uh, looking at uh, certain types of errors and how they affect a particular type of algorithm. So they uh, they decided to use a VQE algorithm, which is a variational quantum eigensolver, where you do a little a quantum step, and then you, you send that answer back to a classical optimizer, and it takes that information and then sends you back a new quantum step to try. And so there's uh, some talking back and forth there. Um, and they were interested in the performance of it uh, with different types of error mitigation techniques. And so what made it really useful on QScout was that we were able to inject noise and different types of noise, and they could look at how these uh, mitigation techniques uh, worked under different types of noise. Uh, for example, one uh, thing that they were looking at was hidden inverses, as well as randomized compiling. So hidden inverse is if you have a, a composite gate. In our case, they were looking at a C0 gate, which uses that basic Molmer Sorensen gate that is common for ions with some with some single qubit gates around it. Um, you can actually reformat it so you can use uh, a molmer sorensen gate with an opposite phase, but still have the same uh, thing at the end. And so that's called a hidden inverse. And randomized compiling, that's when you uh, add a bunch of gates before and after your gate that kind of uh, change what basis you're pointing in and will often have the effect of taking coherent noise and mapping it onto depolarization noise, which for certain algorithms is a much friendlier noise to deal with for, for a variety of reasons. Um, so for their particular algorithm and for the noise uh, sources in our system, we introduced uh, here an under rotation uh, on our two qubit gate um, of, of a tiny amount. And you can see uh, for that type of error, the hidden inverse actually still performed really well. Uh, they, they are looking for, um, as they scan this parameter alpha from side to side, they, they're looking for a value around, I think, negative 1.1, something like that. And uh, you can see these other, uh, like randomized compiling, uh, starts to lift away from that ideal, um, that ideal parabola. So, uh, so not only did uh, were we able to eject noise um, into the system to help them figure out what those different techniques would do, they were able to look at our system and then back out what type of noise we had in our system. So it kind of worked both ways, which was kind of which was a, a pretty interesting process. Uh, 
the third one I'm going to talk about um, is uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, they they had a kind of interesting technique for benchmarking quantum systems. So they, you know, you want to figure out how good your gates are, and um, it's they called it randomized analog verification, and they compared it to another common technique called cross entropy benchmarking. And in this case, they showed that their technique yielded the same results as cross entropy benchmarking, but required fewer shots. So you didn't have to run run it as many times to get the same answer, which uh, might be important going forward if you're trying to calibrate a, a, a larger machine and quickly so you can get away with fewer shots. And that um, kind of starts to add up. They also uh, we're making use of the fact that we use these small angle rotations because they wanted to figure out the sort of average error when we do a small angle gate instead of a, a more typical uh, uh, so-called Clifford gate where it, you know it's sort of in a standard set of gate operations. Okay, so that's some external research that's been done on our system from our user teams, our first round user teams. Um, we also have been doing internal research to make the system better. Um, I don't know, I don't think I'm going to go into too much detail about that, but um, I did mention that one of the special things we had was this arbitrary angle two qubit gate where we can introduce different amounts of entanglement. Uh, that actually took us a while to figure out how to do in a way that we didn't have to calibrate every single gate that, you know, individually calibrate every single gate that the that the user asked for. Instead, we just wanted to calibrate any possible gate that they might ask for. And that actually led to a lot of uh, an interesting study in uh, the amplitude distortion that was happening from our amplifiers and our AOMs, and then also correcting for the AC Stark shift uh, variation. So there were some subtle things that were happening as we just tried to scale the power of one, um, so we would do that gate by just varying the power of the global beam, but it didn't have quite a linear relationship. And so understanding while why that how that linear relationship needed to be accounted for uh, uh, resulted in some kind of interesting internal research. Another, um, yeah, and I'll skip this one. Uh, another thing. Uh, that we did was to uh, improve our performance was uh, looking at how the two qubit gate worked. I showed you that phase diagram. You have to start in the zero and then you come back and then uh, make sure everything's back at zero. Um, there are a couple types of errors. Let's see. Okay, now I need to go back to the pointer, lack of pointer. Um, there's displacement errors where at the end of your gate, you don't end up back at zero. And um, a lot of people have been looking into amplitude and frequency modulation to correct that time, type of error. Uh, we found that we could correct it naturally with a Ga Gaussian just by using a simple Gaussian uh, amplitude shape on our beam. And then that would, those long tails on the Gaussian actually cause the ion to come back to zero pretty, pretty strongly every single time. The other type of error that isn't uh, usually looked at as much is just a, a straight up rotation error where you you know, you end, you start and end. Yeah. So this, this is this cartoon picture thing going on. There's there's a lot more going on under the scenes, but uh, you start and end like you're supposed to, but you just didn't actually uh, get the area enclosed that you wanted. And that happens, you know, it's really just a calibration error, but it also happens, it can happen a lot due to drift, like something might drift underneath you and all of a sudden your system isn't calibrated and you don't get the amount of entanglement that you intended. So um, our team, uh, figured out a way where we could um, originally. Um, I didn't go into too much. Ooh, I didn't go into too much detail about uh, that. Uh, how we do that gate, uh, but we have to detune a little bit from some of the sidebands. And so usually we just detune from one sideband. And so then, if that sideband moves relative to where you are detuned then uh, you get a different interaction strength and you get a different uh, rotate, you know, at ultimate entanglement at the end of the day. Uh, instead, what, what we're doing that's different is we uh, detune in between two sidebands. So if the sidebands shift relative to where you're detuning, you'll get less interaction strength from one sideband, but you'll get more from the other one. 
So that, uh, that actually creates sort of a wider region of acceptable detuning error to allow you to uh, not run into this type of error. So when we, uh, when we looked at that, uh, here you can see we're showing the infidelity, uh, so lower is better, for we're calling that the balanced Gaussian gate. And so you can see there's pretty wide range of frequencies. We can go from minus 10 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz before it, uh, our fidelity starts to actually uh, get worse. Uh, when we don't use that effect, we just have an unbalanced gate. Uh, you can see we have a, a fairly good gate uh, if we're not detuned at all. But um, as soon as the detuning, uh, you get any drift at all, you start to see um, the fidelity, uh, the infidelity go up. Uh, and then the parity scan, that's just a, a common technique in ion traps to show how good your entanglement is. And so this is all of the parity scans for the points that are in this blue curve or in this blue shaded region here. And you can see uh, that uh, we're not getting fooled by something that the fidelity is actually quite good. Um, and so moving forward, uh, as I mentioned, we're looking into that mid-circuit measurement capability to separate some ions for measurement while protecting others, um, which uh, people are very excited about uh, for testing error correction <laughs> protocols, teleportation, uh, and lots of other things that require you to reuse your qubits. Um, that uh, development of that is ongoing. And OK, so in summary, uh, we're a quantum computer that's at Sandia National Labs. Um, and we can look at a wide range of problems. And there's a lot of different research that goes on around this quantum computer. Uh, we do have a graduate student summer inter internship open right now. Uh, if you're interested in applying, you can either contact me, S. Clark, at sandia.gov. Or you can try and navigate the Sandia uh, jobs page for jobs.sandia.gov, and you can type in this ID number, and it will bring up more information. Um, but uh, I, that is notoriously difficult to get right. So uh, please, please contact me. Uh, if you're interested in QScout, we have a web page, qscout.sandia.gov. Jackal is publicly available, so you can get the emulator and you can get the Jackal codes on GitLab. And then you can also email qscout at sandia.gov. So, all right, thanks everyone. And I'll take any questions. Thank you so much for a really interesting lecture. Um,